became Catholic Church in San Diego, California, though I have uh, embellished a little bit. Imagine a big Catholic church. There's a statue of Jesus that stands right outside and the people come to mass and they go right past the statue. And when they go out again, they pass it and they come during the week and they come on Sundays and they walk right by it in all seasons. Perhaps the most pious, most devoted grandmother would stop and gaze up into the face of Jesus sometimes. But you can bet that mostly, most people don't think much of that statue as they go by into the church. But one day, Julio and Ember were walking to middle school and they were kicking a soccer ball around. And on their route, they passed the church and they ran through the courtyard kicking their ball like they normally do. But they kicked it out of sight and around the corner and then they saw it at the foot of the statue. And to their horror, they saw the statue of Jesus with no hands. <laughs> they were waiting and feeling terrible and they thought that they had done it. So Julio started freaking out and he took out his phone to call his parents. But Ember said, well, wait a minute. There's no way our soccer ball could have done that to the statue. Look, it looks like his hands are sawed off or something or broken off on purpose. We couldn't have kicked our ball so hard that it bounced off the statue, knocked off a hand, bounced off the ground, bounced off the statue again, knocked off the other hand and broken them off. It definitely wasn't us. Julio said, okay, but we should go get Father Arturo. So they did. And the priest came outside and asked them what was going on. And they pointed. And he thought, well, this is interesting. And he said, Ember and Julio, thank you so much for letting me know about this. And he eyed their soccer ball and said, I know you didn't do anything wrong. Now, as it happens, I was reading this morning. I'm studying Catholic women saints from around the world this year, because I think it's important to keep learning. And this morning, I read a poem that some people say was written by the 16th century nun, St. Teresa of Avila. Can I read it to you? And so he did. Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on earth, but yours. Julio and Ember thought about that. And they asked, well, does this mean we have to like get him some new hands somehow? Or cut off our hands or something to put them on a statue? No, said Father Arturo, that would hurt. But it means that we're not going to fix a statue. We're gonna leave it like this as a lesson. So later that day when Ember and Julio were walking back from school, they checked on the statue, they saw no hands and they saw a small sign on its base. I have no hands but yours. It's what it said. Will you join me in our hymn this morning? Love will guide us. The words will be in the chat. Giving 
love will guide us through the hard night. If you cannot sing like angels, if you cannot speak before thousands, you can give from deep within you. You can change the world with your love. Love will guide us. Peace has tried us. Hope inside us will lead the way on the road from greed to giving. Love will guide us. In our Five Smooth Stones series, Reflections on Principles of Religious Liberalism by James Luther Adams. We're thinking about this one today. As religious liberals, we deny the immaculate conception of virtue and affirm the necessity of social incarnation. There's this old trope of a certain kind of religious person who thinks God will provide, so I won't act. I have personally not met any people who have said that to me, but the world is wider than my experience. Nonetheless, perhaps you're familiar of, uh, with the story of the man sitting on his roof in a horrible flood saying over and over, God will provide. And someone comes by in a boat and says, get in. And the guy says, no, no, God will provide. And the helicopter tries to evacu evacuate him, but he says, no, 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 God will provide. And then a door floats by and he looks at it and he thinks, no, surely God will provide. And then he drowns and he gets to heaven and he says, why didn't you provide? And God says, what are you talking about? I sent you the neighbor, the helicopter, and even the door. Not particularly challenging for us to hear that old story or the one about the hands of Jesus and think, yes, you know, nothing supernatural, nothing outside of the material or social or political is coming to rescue us. But harder, perhaps, when we examine our own calendars and our own wallets, when we take this out of the theoretical and into the practical, when we look at our last week and we think, how did I spend my time to be the hands of God for my neighbor? Or how did I give my money to be the hands of God for my neighbor? That gets a little more challenging, I bet. Perhaps you have heard the phrase, how you spend your money and how you spend your time are the indicators of what you value. Now that can be complicated by the longer hours for lower wages and higher debt burdens that many, many people are saddled with. Though a way to adopt this lens accounting to the, for the present economic realities that most people face is to say that people value their survival. And more and more of us are having to spend more and more time and money trying to survive. I wanna offer you this lens how we spend our money and how we spend our time indicate what's important to us. Now, I'm not suggesting you run around with a microscope examining the calendars and bank statements of other people, but you might take a look at yours with curiosity, with an open heart, without judgment, but prepared to make some changes. So if, for example, you find yourself often wanting to show up to protests or engage in action around voter registration or local organizing, and each time there's a call to action, you have something previously scheduled, you might wanna get less scheduled. My colleague, the Reverend Elizabeth Wynn writes about this problem and she offers some guidance. There is no easier way, she says, 
What matters is that we are willing to live our lives in the shape of what is being asked, not hope that what we are asked to do will fit the shape of our lives. The social incarnation of virtue indeed. We are in the middle of a grand experiment in the social incarnation of virtue. We are being asked to stay home, to sacrifice in huge ways so that we can protect each other and ourselves, so that we can keep each other safe. I've heard sacrifice described as giving up something you value for something you value more by my colleague to Queen of Boston. And I thought about that a lot this year. We have been doing this for nearly a year, haven't we? Giving up things we value for things we value more. How we spend our time and how we spend our money show us what we value. And this is true on an individual level and a societal level. So if you don't have a lot of either, remember that poverty is created and permitted because extraordinary wealth is created and permitted and hoarded. If you have an excess of either, remember the same. I do not often get up in your pulpit and tell you how to live or what to do quite so straightforwardly as I will today. Perhaps you'll remember this in a few weeks when we start our pledge drive, but today I'm not talking about giving so that your church is strong. I'm talking about what we give away and why in general. So here's how I think about fulfilling my obligation to care for other human beings with my money. I take my annual income after taxes and I divide it by 12. So I have a monthly income and then I subtract my monthly student debt payment. The rest of that number is the number that I use to calculate, quote, my money. And I have, the made, I have made the commitment that I will tithe, which means I will give away 10% of my income after taxes minus debts. So I give to the church. I give monthly to Siembra NC and other grassroots organizations building people power to fight for change. And I give to people who ask in person and online, people I know and people I don't. If you hear nothing else this morning, hear this. The best thing you can do with your money is put straight cash in the hands of people who need it. Not nonprofits or homeless services, not political campaigns or public radio, hands down, the most important, most effective, most life-changing, most dignified thing you can do with your money is to give it to people who ask without question, if you can. In Texas right now, ordinary people are bailing out other ordinary people while their energy bills are permitted to skyrocket. Mutual aid funds and grassroots networks and social media spreading the word. For the curious and for the skeptical, there are studies that show that dollar for dollar, it is direct cash transfer. That is the most effective way to alleviate the burdens of poverty. The most effective cure for homelessness is to give somebody a home. The most effective cure for poverty is to give cash. We live in a system desperately in need of changing. Do not let the need of the system to change prevent you from doing your part in the meantime. Now this is entirely counter to what I was taught and counter to what you might have been taught. If you wanna help people, give cash. Here's the other thing. People know what they need to stay alive, to make it through the day. And when someone on the street stops you and says, hey, can you spare some change? The thing you should do is answer honestly. You should think about if you can spare it. You have to treat people with dignity, not check their clothes or their teeth or look around for liquor bottles or whatever else you can find to judge them and figure out if you think they are worthy of your five bucks or not. It is not for me or for you to determine who is worthy or who is unworthy. 
Now there is a reason that I was taught to wonder what someone would do with the money that I gave them. And that reason has everything to do with, among other things, the Reagan era of politics where welfare queens were smeared, tax cuts for the wealthy were given, the power of unions, the engine of the working class was crippled and wages began to stagnate while profits began to rise. There is a reason that I was taught that it actually was up to me to determine who is worthy or unworthy, right? And that's a reason that I now reject and I encourage you to reject it too. There is no person in need who is worthy or unworthy. There is only need and a life story you don't know and some money you can either spare or not. Do you have change to spare? If you're like me and you don't carry cash, go to the bank, get cash. Keep it in your wallet. Break it up into small bills weekly. Be prepared to give it away. I also set aside a certain dollar amount every week to give to GoFundMes. People trying to fundraise to pay rent, get cars, escape homophobic or transphobic or racist living situations, pay medical bills, raise money for gender confirmation surgery, pay for a safe abortion. These are all things that a society ought to provide. But since it does not, we provide it for one another. So I make a plan to set aside some money and to give it freely and without question when these things pop up in my Facebook feed, in my social media, in my Instagram feed, and on Twitter. If you want to do the same, you might think about prioritizing people who are not likely to have access to networks with a lot of money, right? So we know that racism and homophobia and transphobia all contribute to poverty um, and to, uh, to communities that are impoverished. So your social network is not likely to have a ton of money or you might be cut off from your social network. You should calculate giving like this if your income is predictable at whatever level. If your income is not predictable, you can do this monthly or weekly. You can sacrifice without martyring yourself. If you are someone in need of financial help from others, thank you for asking. People can only help if you ask. And let me be very clear, people can only fill the gap left by tax cuts for the very wealthy and the accumulation of massive profit at the expense of fair wages or cooperative worker ownership, if you ask. Poverty and wealth are not accidents. There is no such thing as people who are less fortunate or more fortunate. It is not fortune. A society that permits the hoarding of wealth and the starving and struggle of humanity is a wicked one. And if there is shame among us about money due to our own wealth or our own poverty, let us reject individual shame and move through the collective shame that is ours to heal, ours to change. I know this subject can be difficult. I wish I could see your faces. I wish we were in the church together so we could talk about this together over real coffee and potluck. Many people have real trauma around money. I want to remind you that you can make an appointment to talk with me at any time about this or other difficult subjects if you want. Remember that money and time are expressions of what we value. If you don't have a lot of either, perhaps what you need to value most is your own survival and the survival of your family. And that's okay. But also, if you have ever been in serious need, you might be more likely to figure out what you can spare because you know the difference that $5 makes at the end of the day. You might be comfortable now, but if ever there was a period of your life where you lived in poverty, you might still have a lot of fear and a lot of emotion around money. So perhaps considering these things is an opportunity for you to do some healing work. 
You might be uncomfortable because you're wealthy and you've realized that you don't give as much as you think you should. You certainly aren't taxed as much as you ought to be. That's okay. There's mercy in every morning. It's never too late to learn or to make some different decisions. I will eventually inherit some family money, though I live pretty modestly now. And when eventually some of that family money shows up in my bank account, I will also inherit some serious obligations to give much of it away. None of this is easy. But the need for these kinds of conversations and this kind of explicit guidance from a community that talks about values and justice is becoming clearer and clearer by the day. So you might hear this sermon and feel enormous relief. Finally, some straight talk about money. Finally, some guidance that will help me live more fully into my values. Finally, some way forward for me to make a plan, make repair, offer help, ask for help, feel more deeply connected to the flow of life around me. Know that I am doing my small part. It is possible that you have never heard such explicit instruction around money in a religious community before. This is not a particularly comfortable topic to talk about, but we can do hard things together. We can figure things out together. We can live more deeply into the things we are called to do together. We can change our lives together. We can participate in creating a more just world together. The social incarnation of virtue happens in your body, in your calendar, in your bank account. Think on all these things. And may the love that holds us all move you to act. Amen. Will you join me in our hymn number 298 in your gray hymnal, Wake Now My Senses. The words will be on the screen. This video is by the UU Fellowship of the South Hills. Wake now my senses and hear the earth call, feel the deep power of being in all, keep with the web of creation your vow, giving, receiving as love shows us how, wake now my out to the new join with each pilgrim who quest for the true honor the beauty and wisdom of time suffer thy limit and praise the sublime wake now compassion give heed to the with justice 